The news at noon starts right now. A morning operation to clear out and clean up the homeless camp under the overpass near 37 in Brooklyn still underway. Max Massey went there this morning. He joins us now live to give us a look what's going on out there. Hey, Max. Well, good. Hey guys, since we've been here, they have already cleaned up so much. We're told there were more than 50 tents of people living under the overpass and take a look now, mostly cleaned up. In fact, just a few moments ago, we saw a machine pick up and haul off the last tent on this side of the under the overpass. There's still one on the other side. But guys, we spoke to the sergeant on the scene. He told me the main reasons for today's cleanup and clearing out was because of a string of violent crimes. And guys, take a look, pretty much mostly cleaned up. Now, in terms of those violent crimes that he was alluding to, he told me that they had some issues such as shooting, stabbings. And he told me someone was even set on fire. There was examples of extortion, pay for protection, not to mention the health hazards. There was feces and people going to the bathroom everywhere. Now, those living here, they are supposed to go to the Haven for Help or SAM Ministries. Now, I'm told this was not an abrupt operation. The sergeant told me that SAPD was out here last Wednesday to evaluate the situation. They actually found a few veterans. They offered some outreach options to them as well. Haven for Hope brought out a van. I'm told SAPD is going to do their best to try to maintain the area, not just for this site, but as well as other homeless encampment sites as well. They said they're going to look into some of the situations, try to work with other operations and try to figure out what comes next. In terms of who's in charge of today's operation, the health department is coordinating it all. And I'm told it is a cooperative effort. Now, the sergeant also wanted to point out that these people living here, they're not bad people. They each have their own story. And we actually spoke to a few people who are living here under the overpass. A little bit of frustration in their regards, as you can imagine but they tell me that they're now trying to figure out what comes next for them. This is clearly an evolving situation with more updates soon to come. So make sure to stay with us online and on air as that becomes available. Guys. All right, Max, thank you very much. One man has learned the hard way that a car and even his feet couldn't outrun police. Castle Hills officers caught him and arrested him early this morning after a chase that raced through several neighborhood streets. As Katrina Weber reports, it ended with officers using a taser on him. Inside a patrol car is not where this 20 year old expected to end up. Castle Hills police say Gage Hartz had hoped to get away when they tried to stop him near Blanco and Loop 410 around 2.30 this morning. They say he led them on a chase going as fast as 80 to 90 miles per hour. Everything came crashing down when he crashed into a parked car near Ramsey Road and San Pedro. Out here on the street, you can see the telltale signs of what had to be a pretty forceful crash. But oddly, no one here seems to have heard or seen anything. Even with the damage, police say Hartz wasn't done. Officers used a taser on him when he tried to run. Inside his car was a passenger complaining about injuries. She was taken to a hospital for treatment. Hartz, meanwhile, went to jail with a list of charges against him. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. New at noon, an investigation now underway after a man was shot on the city's southeast side. Just before 8 o'clock last night, police were called to the 600 block of Bailey Avenue. According to police, a 61-year-old man says he heard gunshots when he went to his front door to investigate. He was shot in the calf. He was taken to the hospital, but he's expected to be okay. A San Antonio father and son facing charges linked to the capital chaos earlier last month took part in a preliminary court hearing this morning. James Sonny Upmore and his son Chance were arrested at their home last month. They're facing charges of knowingly entering or remaining in a restricted building and disorderly conduct on capital grounds. They are facing a maximum punishment of up to a year in prison and a $100,000 fine. It's official. Fiesta is postponed this year. However, some big Fiesta events have been canceled altogether. And this noon, one more was added to the list, the Battle of Flowers Band Festival. The Battle of Flowers Association announcing on Wednesday that the decision was made to cancel the band festival after the Fiesta Commission rescheduled the party with a purpose. The Battle of Flowers Band Festival hosts more than 5,000 area high school students in a marching band competition and performance. It draws some 20,000 spectators to Alamo Stadium each spring. 
The Battle of Flowers Band Festival vice president said that the association is looking forward to continuing the band festival in 2022. Here's a look at the latest numbers when it comes to coronavirus cases in Bear County. 15 more people have died. The 24 hour seven day average rising to 1510 COVID-19 cases. That includes District 10 Councilman Clayton Perry, who announced he was infected. Mayor Ron Nuremberg says we appear to have stabilized the condition of our hospitals. 1176 patients are hospitalized. 399 are in the intensive care unit with COVID and 232 patients are on ventilators. Experts say the next six weeks of distributing the COVID-19 vaccines will be crucial to stem the number of cases in the U.S. and fend off new variants. ABC's Mary Alice Park says the latest developments on where the Biden administration says vaccine supplies will be shipped. Across the country, an urgent call for more vaccines and equal access. Local Virginia officials saying hundreds of older adults eligible for the vaccine are frustrated there are not more shots available. It's heartbreaking when people want the vaccine and are unable to get it. In Texas, this mobile clinic trying to get COVID-19 vaccines to neighborhoods too often overlooked. Well, I was hoping this really just helped people who didn't have the ability to um, get transportation to some of the other vaccination sites. The vac Vaccine rollout is ramping up nationwide, but as of Tuesday, fewer than 8% of Americans have gotten at least one dose of the vaccine. Due to the current supply constraints, this will be limited when it begins making sure that we are picking pharmacies in that first phase that are located in areas that are harder to reach to ensure that we have equitable distribution. In California, early evidence that white residents are more likely to receive the vaccine so far. The potentially life-saving vaccines cannot come soon enough. The virus still taking thousands of American lives every day. Just five days after celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary, Sally and Manny Monteño passed away, the two dying within seconds of each other. Their family saying, they lived for one another. And it was the way that they would have wanted it. And it just showed the depth of their love for one another. Dr. Anthony Fauci, the White House chief medical advisor, says that even though there's a rise in those COVID-19 variants, they're still not dominant in the cases we're seeing. He says the best way to protect against them, get vaccinated, wear your mask, and socially distance. Mary Alice Parks, ABC News, New York. We have another reminder, our KSET community partner, University Health, hosting a blood drive this month. It'll take place on February 18th and 19th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the Whitty Museum. That's on Broadway. To take part, all you have to do is make an appointment by calling the phone number on your screen, 210-358-2812, or visit donatebloodtoday.com. You can also find this information on ksatcommunity.com. Some warm temperatures today and tomorrow, then a front moves through. What does that mean for our forecast in the weekend? We'll take a look ahead coming up. And the Spurs are facing a Minnesota team that's getting a little healthier. What that means for them tonight. Larry Mears with that coming up in sports. Welcome back. Last year, two former NFL players who are black sued the league, claiming when it comes to being compensated for head injuries they sustained while playing the game, they were held to a different standard because of their race. Now emails obtained exclu exclusively rather by ABC News appears to show that several doctors who work with the NFL privately discussing the lawsuit said that they felt factoring in race was all but required in their evaluations. ABC's Andrew Dimbert has the latest. Two black former NFL players are suing the league, alleging the concussion settlement fund that was set up discriminates against black players. Former defensive lineman Keevan Henry and former running back Najee Davenport submitted claims to the landmark 2013 concussion settlement program, which pays eligible former players for the effects of head injuries while suffered on the field. But Henry and Davenport's lawyers say their clients were denied awards based on a discriminatory testing regime that weighs sociological factors like race. I've had 10 concussions or more. I've had at least 17 surgeries. 
17. In 2017, a neurologist determined Henry was suffering from a cognitive decline consistent with mild dementia. But in its rejection of Henry's claim, the administrator questioned whether his performance on the test was valid and asserted that the doctor used inappropriate norms. Two years later, Henry went in for another evaluation. This time, the clinician used an NFL-recommended formula that took into account age, gender, education, and race and concluded that Henry did not qualify for compensation. Two different systems? I, 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 how, how can that be okay? Why should that be okay? I just wanna be looked at the same way as a white guy. It's a controversial practice commonly known as race norming. In medicine, it's supposed to help doctors make better diagnoses by using race to make assumptions about a patient's background. Critics say it's not an accurate tool and has no place in the settlement program. It's almost the classic definition of racial discrimination, using race as a basis of denying benefits. Emails obtained by ABC News appear to show several neuropsychologists who work with the NFL privately discussing the lawsuit, saying they felt factoring for race was all but required under the program. One saying if they didn't use the racial norms, there would be multiple inquiries levied at them. Another saying their required reliance on racial norms, bottom line, do discriminate against black players. In a statement to ABC News, the NFL calls the lawsuit entirely misguided. The league says race norming, part of what they call demographic correction, is recommended but not required. And the NFL also says that the concussion settlement program was agreed to by all parties with the assistance of expert neuropsychological clinicians. Andrew Dimbert, ABC News, Washington. Outside with life, are we close to some kind of record? I mean, this this is weird in the middle of February. You would think, but no. Oh. Even tomorrow, when we're in the 80s, we'll probably fall short of the record. But it's just a couple days because things will cool down a little bit with a frontal boundary coming up tomorrow. The aquifer is down a tenth of a foot, down again today at 664.1. And your pollen count, we've got four allergens, quite a few there, but they're all in the low category, so it's all good. Molds at 200, mountain cedars down to 80, so no big problems there. We have several fronts to talk about, maybe just maybe a little bit of rain too. We've got that forecast coming up. I'm kind of disappointed, no records today. I was kind of maybe tomorrow. To maybe keep my fingers crossed if we get a record. And then next week we'll have snow, right? Ooh, no, no, <laughs> not gonna. Happen. No, no, it, it does look like it could be <laughs> colder. <laughs> Uh, I did that on purpose. He yeah. he had warned us that the models were <laughs> being whack go whack a doodle. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. Uh, what we did see this morning was a little bit of fog in spots, and you can see that here on our time lapse. Beautiful shot. Looks kind of hazy there. Eh, some patchy fog off in the distance, and then notice a couple last frames here. You notice more clouds are starting to move in. Indication that moisture's on its way up. Humidity levels on their way up. 66 degrees right now at the airport. Dew point is at 52. That number has been on the rise all day long with southerly winds at about 11 miles per hour. 67 right now in Boulevard, 71 in New Braunfels, 67 Randolph, 68 Stinson, 72 Pleasanton. 73 right now in Kennedy, 73 in Catula. It's going to be a warm day. Most of us will be in the 70s and we could even see a few 80s today, tomorrow goes even warmer. We mentioned some of those uh, higher dew points now starting to funnel in here. Dew points close to 60 on some, in some of our southeastern counties. And we can see that also with the cloud cover. More clouds now to our south and east, all showing that, uh, yes, that moisture is starting to move back in. It'll be brief, though. 74 this afternoon. We'll call it mostly sunny. Southerly winds anywhere from 5 to 15 miles per hour. And it will not be all that cold tonight going into tomorrow morning. Here's a look at some of the daytime highs for today. 81 in Catula, 79 the expected high in Carrizo Springs. We go all the way up to 76 in New Braunfels. Here's the forecast. And it uh, does look like we'll get some morning clouds tomorrow. So it starts off cloudy. There could be a little bit of fog, although I think winds will be strong enough to where it won't be a big issue. Clouds will burn off and then we'll get uh, sun tomorrow afternoon which will make for those very warm temperatures out ahead of our cold front. Cold front slides through tomorrow evening, does not bring us any rain, just brings us some gusty winds. And Friday is looking a little bit cooler and a little breezy too. Uh, as we look down the line here, we want to go all the way up into Canada. Always a good indication of where that cold air is. It sits up here, but these numbers are even colder, 35 below in copper mine, negative 40, negative 22, negative 26. The cold air is bottled up there. Sometimes that can spill down 
into the United States, and it looks like we may get a little bit of that as we go into the weekend. This is Saturday. Watch the temperature in Minneapolis. It goes down to negative 13. Wind chills will probably be negative 30, something like that. Very, very cold, and that cold air does try to push south next week. Still lots of questions about how far south it would make it when uh, so that cold air would arrive to Texas. And it, I think for the most part, we would just get a glancing blow. But as we get into Tuesday and Wednesday, something to watch. Could be a little bit colder. Maybe just maybe we could get some rain out of this too. Uh, we have added some rain chances into the seven day forecast for Monday and Tuesday. So here's how it looks. 74 again today, 80 tomorrow. We start off with fog and clouds. And then it does get windy as we get into Friday morning, especially temperatures drop down to 65 70 on Saturday. Another front moves through, cools us down just a little bit on Sunday, brings more breezy conditions. And then Monday right now, 20% chance of rain, 66. Tuesday is going to be a day where temperatures will probably be all over the board. But uh, right now we're going to go with 55 and a 20% chance of rain. And we'll keep an eye on what transpires next week if we do indeed see some cooler temperatures guys they told you it was going to change okay Look forward <laughs> to that hey speaking of changes the spurs need to change man they're hurting in more ways than one aren't they yeah and they keep losing uh to teams that are short-handed but you know i think it's just part of this younger core they're still learning how to play they're still learning how to close out games and they're still learning how to play with some of their veterans like lamarcus aldridge la is out tonight and that means Jakob Purta will likely get to start at center. And in men's college basketball, Texas played pay Baylor pretty darn tough, but they just didn't have enough to get over the hump at the end. Coming up. The Spurs will host the Minnesota Timberwolves tonight to close out their five-game homestand, and they'll do so with that big man, LaMarcus Aldridge who's out with right hip flexor soreness. That means center Jakob Pertl is the likely candidate to start for L.A. He's already started three games this season when Aldridge didn't play with an injury, and he just sees it as another game to hoop. I mean, I'm approaching it like I any other game. Um, I'm just trying to go out there and do my job. I'm trying to be aggressive. Uh, obviously, with um, a guy like L.A. being out, um, couple of guys are going to have to step up and, and take up the slack and yeah I, I count myself in there and I'm definitely going to, going to try and do that. Minnesota comes to town after splitting a home and away series with the Cavaliers. They beat them Sunday at home 109-104, then lost at Cleveland Monday 100-98. The T-Wolves have lost eight straight on the road, and at 5-15, and they are last in the Western Conference. Carl Anthony Towns has only played in four games this season, and tonight he's out again for health and safety protocols. Still, the Timberwolves are slowly getting some guy back. You know, I think that's a good problem to have, and, you know, it, it puts – you know, it can put people on notice too. If you're you're not doing the right things, um, you know, we got guys uh, who are coming along. You know, maybe maybe that might be slotted behind you in the depth chart, but um, also guys that that are uh, able to to produce some. Um, you know, so that's a good problem to have, and you know, that's that's something. You know, as a, as a coach, you know, you're not going to have everybody be happy with with their minutes, and I understand that. Um, you know, but you know, guys have helped themselves through through these opportunities right now. Spurs the host of Timberwolves tonight at 7.30. San Antonio is favored by 8.5. Number two, Baylor played at number six, Texas, last night of men's college basketball. And the Longhorns played them tough, taking their first lead of the game in the second half on this breakaway slam dunk from Andrew Jones. He led the Horns with 21 points, but Baylor would pull away after that behind guard Davion Mitchell in his game high 27 points, 15 of them from three-point range. Baylor wins 83-69 to remain undefeated at 17-0, 9-0 in the Big 12, something they're not thinking about. We've been so focused on the next opponent, and uh, uh, I think uh, um, once we stop doing that, then, then we won't have to worry about being undefeated. So uh, each and every day, we want to we win the day, and uh, we want to make sure uh, uh, we put our best foot forward. We know each game we play, it's a Big 12 game. You don't bring it, you got no chance to win. And if you leave it all out there, you can live with the results. But obviously a big difference there is that we turned the ball over 17 times, and we were three for 14 from the foul line. So um, you just can't have those two things uh, in addition to some of the defensive breakdowns we had. All right, Texas will play at Oklahoma State Saturday at 2 p.m. and Baylor 
will host TCU Saturday at 3. Three of 14 from the foul line? Yeah. Wow. Doesn't seem free. Today. <laughs> Ooh. Come to work on a practice today. There you go. All right, Larry, thanks. New today at 5, the Super Bowl, just a few days away. So how do you have the perfect TV for it? Consumer Reports has some tips on adjusting your TV so you can have the best watching experience of the Super Bowl. It's today at 5 after Entertainment Tonight. Scientists in the UK believe the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine may slow down transmission of the coronavirus. The researchers at the University of Oxford collected nasal swabs from participants and found that after two doses of the vaccine, the rate of positive COVID tests decreased by 50 percent. Scientists say positivity rates would not have changed if the vaccine simply weakened infections. The study did not measure transmission directly. UK researchers meantime leading the way in understanding how the coronavirus mutates and what it means for our ability to fight it. CNN Scott McLean went inside the country's massive variant detection operation and filed this report. If there is a secret weapon in the global fight against a mutating coronavirus, you might find it here, a cluster of buildings just off the highway near Cambridge. Every day, vans arrive at the Sanger Institute, carrying thousands of COVID swabs from across the country, where they're stored in industrial freezers. All just waiting to be sequenced. Yeah, a mixture of negative and positive samples at the moment. A robot picks out the positive samples from the negative ones and puts them on a separate tray, which is sealed. In another lab, hundreds of samples get mixed into a single vial. So in this single sequencing run, there'll be over 700 SARS-CoV-2 samples. You guys are pretty efficient. This is uh, industrial sequencing, yeah. Special chemicals are added, the tubes are shaken up, pressed between two pieces of glass, and then put into giant computers to be genetically sequenced. 15 hours later, they spit out so much genetic data, entire server farms have been built to house it. After that, scientists on site and at a network of universities across the UK start searching through the data. We're looking for mutations that may allow the, the virus to either be more transmissible or to cause more severe disease. And there are mutations that we think might affect the ability of the vaccines to protect people. Less than two months ago, that data was used to identify a faster spreading variant of the virus called B117. That variant was first spotted in an unlikely place here in Kent in southeast England, famous for its white cliffs, rolling countryside and a lot of people who make the daily commute to London. It wasn't long before the variant was detected in the capital and eventually throughout the four nations of the UK and in dozens of other countries. The CDC says it could become the dominant coronavirus strain in the US by March. That is the UK variant B117. You can see Professor Ravi Gupta had been studying an immunocompromised person who couldn't shake the virus for more than three months, giving new mutations time to multiply inside a body that couldn't fight back. When Gupta checked that sequencing database, he found a COVID-19 variant that shared a key mutation with the one his patient was fighting. How likely is it that patient zero was an immunocompromised person? I think it's very, very likely. We found very few, virtually no sequences that are highly related to the B117 variant. In other words, it popped out of nowhere. Gupta's ongoing research has so far found that vaccines are still largely effective even on the new variant, but maybe not for long. Viruses are already on their way to becoming more resistant to the immune system and to vaccines. Scott McLean, CNN in Southeast England. Variants have been found in Brazil and South Africa, where scientists have the tools to sequence the virus's genome. genome. However, many other countries don't have those tools, so the British government has volunteered to just do it for them. The parliament in Japan making a new law to help slow down the COVID-19 cases. The law will find patients who refuse hospitalization or provide false reports to health officials. Businesses that fail to cooperate with orders to reduce their operating hours will face punishment. The new law goes into effect on February 13th. This comes as Japan extended its state of emergency for 10 of its prefectures until March. Taking a look outside with live cam. Oh, 
go outside for lunch today if you can. It's Look one, at that. that. This is perfect. It's one of those days. It really is. Uh, it doesn't get much better than this in February. I feel like I've said that a lot, but it... It got better today. Uh, we'll see even warmer temperatures coming up tomorrow. Let's take a look at some of the headlines. Uh, today, beautiful, as we mentioned. Tomorrow, we start off with fog, but then we'll probably get 80s tomorrow afternoon. It turns cooler and breezy on Friday, so that's the first change. Our first of a uh, few fronts headed our way late tomorrow evening. Temperatures right now, 67 Boulevardy, 72 already in Casterville, 73 in Pleasanton, so it is warming up quickly. 67 Tarpley, 68 right now in Kerrville. And as we look across the country, still pretty mild across the plains, 64 in Dallas, 54 Oklahoma City. Still got some cold weather up across the northeast with snow on the ground, 26 in Cleveland, 36 in New York. And then actually, Quite a bit colder there in parts of Florida. They had a front come through. It is now colder in Miami than it is here. We're one of the warmer spots across the country. Pretty interesting there. Forecast for us, 74 this afternoon, mostly sunny. Southerly winds 5 to 15 miles per hour. Again, a few fronts headed our way. We'll show you how it affects our forecast and the seven-day forecast coming up here in just a few minutes, guys. Thanks, Justin. The last year or so has been dominated by news of the pandemic, but when it comes to your health, you need to remember heart disease is still a very real danger. As Max Massey shows us, February is American Heart Month, so make sure you're aware of your heart health. 46 years old and I had a heart attack. I didn't even know what was happening. Tim Stewart is not only a photojournalist here at KSAT, he's also a friend who survived a heart attack. The wife and I were sitting at a wedding reception and uh, I just got this flop sweat and and this burning sensation down my neck and shoulders and just it kept getting worse and worse and worse. A scary situation for anyone, but even more terrifying because Tim, the father of two, knows how dangerous heart disease can be. My father had just turned 55 when he had the one heart attack that took his life. We see people even without risk factors having heart disease, so unfortunately everybody is uh, you know, vulnerable to it. Uh, but the good thing is I want people to to know that they can empower themselves to change that uh, if that's in their future. Heart disease can be genetic and can come in various ways, but it can also be prevented. Listen to your doctor, listen to your body. You know, there's some preemptive things that you can do. In general, eating, you know, plenty of fruits and vegetables, uh, lean meat, avoiding fried foods, avo avoiding a lot of refined processed foods and avoiding you know very high sugary foods especially if uh, you are diabetic uh, if you are diabetic really staying uh, on top of what your blood glucose is what your blood sugar is and here in san antonio heart disease is a prevalent problem a problem you need to be aware of and a problem that doctors here see on a daily basis heart disease is a major problem uh, in san antonio and part of that is because there's a connection with diabetes unfortunately diabetes does is one of the major risk factors uh, for heart disease and not only that it can make it difficult to recognize because people with diabetes don't have typical symptoms after triple bypass surgery tim's life really has changed forever and that's uh, a statin cholesterol medicine it's blood pressure medicine and it's a blood thinner and i'll be taking those three medicines for the rest of my life however i hope that that life is a lot longer than 40 something and on top of asking others to live a healthier lifestyle tim has some simple advice for everyone out there don't take it for granted i think i did i'll never do it again if you have any questions there are resources easily available just head to the american heart association max massey case at 12 news and we're glad he is still with us a lot more life to live tim all right, the Golden Globes kicking off a very unusual award season. However, some fan favorites made the list of nominees. We're going to take a look later in the show. And getting down to the nitty gritty with boys basketball, a look at Antonian coming up with Larry Mirrors in a few minutes. This year's Globes postponed nearly two months because of the pandemic and to adjust to the delayed Oscars. Now the nominations are out. David Fincher's Mank is leading the pack with six nods. Aaron Sorkin's The Trial of the Chicago 7, which like Mank is a Netflix release, came in second with five nominations. The other nominees for best film in the drama category were Nomadland, Pro Missing Young Woman, oh, I'm sorry, Promising Missing Young Woman, and The Father. 
a year after fielding no female nominees for Best Director or Best Feature Film nomination for any movie directed by a woman, the Hollywood Foreign Press nominated more female filmmakers than it had ever before. That includes Regina King for One Night in Miami. There are some unsurprising nominations like Hamilton nominated for Best Musical or Comedy Film. And in the Best Television Series category, the nominees included that show we can only call The Creek, although we've come up with some other ways to say it. Hmm. The big show airs February 28th. Let's just say it's a dirty diaper kind of word. There you go. <laughs> that pretty much explains it. Any parent <laughs> yeah. has a word for it. Yeah, well, we'll go opposite here and take a look at this beautiful picture. Uh, blue skies out there. Live cam shows us that we've got a great day underway. Temperatures are already starting to get close to 70 degrees. 66 so far, 42 the low this morning. So we're right on average now, but we go above average this afternoon. The record is 85 set in 1911. Tomorrow, the record is right there again in the mid 80s. We'll be in the low 80s, so we'll get close to the record. I don't think we set it tomorrow. Uh, the record low today is 12, set back in 1951. Again, a lot of fronts to look at, and a seven-day forecast will tell you what that means for temperatures. Coming up. Have we got deals for you? Welcome to KSATDeals.com. Get ready to revolutionize your bathroom experience and stop using toilet paper. How do you do that? With a bidet. The Slim Glow Bidet Attachment by BioBidet also features a night light. BioBidet believes that everyone deserves a clean and comfortable bathroom experience. You'll get everything you need to transform any toilet in your house. It's an easy DIY installation. Place the attachment and connect directly to your water supply with a provided brass adapter and braided metal hose. Requires no electricity, no wires, no extra plumbing, no hassle. The bidet has pressure control dial knobs, plus you'll save a bundle on all of the toilet paper that you won't have to buy. Now the retail price, $79. The case that deals price, $49.99. That is a 36% discount. Head over to caseatdeals.com for this deal, plus many more. I think we've reached a moment in the early part of February where you could actually eat lunch outside. Oh, yeah. This is awesome. Absolutely. Yes, it is nice. But if you're going to eat lunch in Florida, you got to be careful because they've issued uh, a warning again for falling iguanas. You may remember this oh, no. last year. Uh, this happens every now and then in the winter in Florida. It gets so cold that the, the iguanas are cold blooded. They slow down or become immobile. And when Tim's drop into when Tim's drop into the 40s, they may fall from trees, but they're not it is real. They're not, they're not dead. They're just sort of frozen, more or less, quite literally. Um, there you go. The in, uh, National Weather Service in Miami put this out. So, yes, it, uh, it got cold down there, and it can happen. I just want to make sure you're not being scammed. No, it's, uh, it's the real deal. Outside right now, we've got blue skies here. Temperatures uh, sitting in the 60s. Gorgeous day underway. 66 degrees at the airport, 68 Stinson, 69 at Kelly. Notice the winds are out of the south anywhere from 5 to 15 miles per hour. This is ushering in a little bit more moisture, and we can see that in the form of some clouds. Just a few of them, not a big deal, but we're starting to see some more clouds show up. And temperature-wise, we're already in the 70s there around Castroville. 73 degrees there, 71 in New Braunfels, 75 in Pleasanton, one of the warmer spots. 74 in Kennedy, 71 Victoria. And you see more clouds closer to the coast. That's where some of the uh, deeper humidity, deeper moisture is at this moment. Dew points are trying to jump up. 59 in Beeville, 52 here in San Antonio. We'll see the dew points get up close to 60 by tomorrow morning, which should lead to some cloud cover and maybe a little bit of patchy fog, although it looks like winds are going to be a little strong for any fog tomorrow morning. Temperature-wise, Today, 74, the expected high here in town, 77 in Honda. We'll get close to 80 down there in Carrizo Springs, maybe above 80 in Cotua here in San Antonio. Temperatures should top out in the mid-70s. And then, again, it's not going to be a lot cold tonight with the uh, added humidity and cloud cover, probably only dropping into the 50s, uh, maybe 40s for lows. Forecast uh, calls for clouds tomorrow morning, so they build in. It's going to be a cloudy start. Then by about midday, clouds burn off. We get sun, and out ahead of this front, it's going to get fairly warm, 80s on the map for a lot of us. Front moves through, turns breezy, somewhat cooler on your Friday. Not, not bitterly cold, but cooler. And uh, winds will probably stay somewhat breezy through the day on Friday, too. As we look at temperatures across the country, 
Uh, it is still pretty chilly up across the northeast. Uh, warmth has spread north across the plains. Not all that cold now, but as we look north, and we showed you the Canadian temperatures a little bit earlier, the pretty extreme numbers here. Negative 35, negative 18, negative 27, negative 40. And I say extreme this is fairly typical for this time of year to get the pretty cold stuff up here in Canada. But sometimes that'll slide south and we'll feel some of that here in the states. And that is possible as we get into next week. That'll be something to watch. I think the bulk of the really cold stuff stays off to our north, but we can feel a little bit of it here. Wouldn't be until late next week, though. So here's how our seven day forecast plays out. 74 today, 80 tomorrow with some uh, morning fog and clouds. Front comes through, turns a little bit windy as we get into uh, Friday morning, especially 65 on your Friday, 70 on Saturday. Another front comes through Saturday into Sunday. That creates more breezy conditions and only cools us down a little bit there on Sunday, 68. We'll get a 20% chance of rain on Monday, so we do get some rain chances back in play. And then on Tuesday, we have the potential to go well, a little bit colder, 55 right now, and a 20% chance of rain as well. And again, next week could be fairly active in the sense we could see some colder air. We'll keep you posted, and we'll be right back.